Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Burlington's 2023 Remembrance of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am honored to be able to welcome you here to the UU Church and to yet uh, another year of celebrating the life of Dr. Martin Luther King in this way. Burlington is so fortunate that for more than 30 years, even through the challenging two COVID-19 winners of the past couple, uh, that Patrick Brown and his Multicultural Resource Center have been gathering us on this Sunday before MLK Day to increase awareness and provide opportunities to celebrate, promote, and support cultural diversity within our community. The list of individuals that Patrick has brought into our small city is just remarkable, and he has done it again this year. I want to welcome Dr. Archer. Yeah. We're grateful and honored that you've trekked through the cold. I, I know you thanked me for it not being too cold, but that you've trekked all the way up here to our small community to be with us. For much of the 30 plus years that Patrick has been doing this work, the city in some ways left it to him and other BIPOC leaders to do the heavy lifting in moving our community towards our racial and equity, our racial equity and justice goals, the, the goals and ideals that Dr. King represented. I am proud that since 2019, the city has taken a very intentional and proactive role in this work with the creation of our own racial equity, inclusion and belonging department. In the just over three years since the department was started, we have invested heavily in it and built a great team to work on initiatives ranging from racial equity training for all of our employees in the city of Burlington to efforts to increase, increase our shockingly low rate of black home ownership to creating a coalition to work across all the social determinants of health to end the public health emergency of racism. I'm grateful to say that since November, that team has been led by our new REIB director, Kim Carson. So, you know, Kim has been here such a short time that I know not all of you have had the opportunity to meet her yet. So I'm excited that Kim is able to be with us today. I wanted to ask her to stand up and be recognized so everyone can get a chance to say hello. Kim comes to us after 11 years working in the Iowa judicial system and as a former Olympic level track athlete. She's a great leader and colleague and she has already demonstrated an eagerness and ability to help the city take on some of our toughest community challenges. Just this week, I announced that Kim will chair a new mayor's task force on gun violence in the wake of a year in which the city experienced far more gun violence than we ever have before. It is by confronting the realities of racial inequity and injustice in our past and in our present, and by listening and collaborating with all of you, our local community leaders, and national experts like Dr. Archer, that the city hopes to do its part to honor the legacy of Dr. King and the other giants of America's long quest for universal civil rights. It's through this work that Burlington will do its part to ensure a more just and equitable future for generations to come. So thank you again for being here today and honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in this way. I, I wanna invite you to come out, if you can, again tomorrow uh, at ECHO for a day of events honoring and affirming the legacy of Dr. King through art and celebration. Events will run from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m including a civil rights panel by, again, the Greater Burlington Multicultural Center, which is at 3 p.m. down at ECHO, where Kim will join a panel of local civil rights and justice leaders. The city is happy to be a partner in the ECHO celebration again for the 11th year. Admission to the museum and all the events tomorrow is free and families are welcome. So with that, welcome and thank you once again for spending part of your day with us today.
Good afternoon. Just doing a mic check. <laughs> so the song that I'm about to do is titled Black and Blue. One of the top issues that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was to end the struggles of discrimination and segregation. He advocated for self-identity. I think he used to call it self-worth, somebodiness, and he wanted everyone to feel that they mattered. Oftentimes, black people turn to music for self-soothing, a way to release the pain. And black and blue captures those feelings. So as I sing this song, I would ask you to delve deeper, delve deeper. Don't just listen intellectually, but listen with your heart and picture what it's like for black people when they are discriminated. I'm hot. Start again. I'm, I'm taught to be proud. Still, I'm not allowed. Speaking, no, I'm being heard. It seems rather strange. Some things never change. Some lessons they never get learned. I've come a long ways since back in the days in Dixie when cotton was king. The heartache remains from the storms I've been through. Yet right now I'm black and blue. I stayed on my knees, I cried and I grieved. It's hard to forgive and forget. But memories still rise, and I'm still asking why do people treat people like that? And God looks at my skin. I'm lovely to him. He met me and said it was good. And but people still judge. And I'm still asking why. Why am I black and blue? I've nothing to gain by shifting the blame. I'm saying at last, let the past be the past, but I am not naive. I am black. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. The last will be first. The servant be served. And we are all bound to reap what we sow. When love finally wins, someday hatred will lose. Till then, I'll be black and blue. Someday love will win. Someday hatred will lose. But I'll still be black. But I'll no longer be blue. Thank you.
Today we come together to remember the late civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and his widow, Coretta Scott King. When Dr. King delivered the famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963 at the Lincoln Memorial, he not only spoke to African Americans, but he spoke to the hearts and minds of the entire world. It is with this notion that I welcome you all here today. Senator Sanders, in his message to me, said that we need equity for black and brown people, indigenous people, and for the millions of people who are made disposable and denied basic human dignity by our society. Our struggle is and has always been about justice, racial justice, gender justice, social justice, environmental justice, youth justice, and economic justice. As we come together in the fight, we cannot allow others to divide us and reinforce systems of oppression. Today, as I welcome you, I would like to welcome the mayor of Burlington. I would like to welcome Beth Awati, representing the office of Senator Sanders, city councilors, especially Councillor Paul. Are you here, Councillor Paul? Celebrating a birthday today also. Chief Mirad. Special welcome to Kim Carson, the city's new racial equity, inclusion, and belonging director. And this annual event will not be possible without the generous support of the city of Burlington, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, Champlain Housing Trust, City Market, Courtyard Marriott, Howard Center, Key Bank, m and Bank, Spruce Mortgage, and most of all, the Unitarian Universalist Society. Thanks to the Congolese Catholic Choir that you will hear later on, and to Ms. Webster and Mr. Jack Hansen. The MLK events, as the mayor mentions, continue tomorrow at ECHO with a day of remembrance of the late civil rights leader. How honored are we that today we have one of the great civil rights advocates, Deborah Archer, here with us. It was a little scary when we found out that her flight was canceled yesterday. She is the first, Ms. Archer is the first black national president of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. <laughs> that means continuing to do the hard work of challenging the structures that fuel systemic racism and ingenuity in housing, voting rights, access to resources, and more, all of which the, her organization is tackling in its newly launched systemic equality program. Ms. Archer, Dr. Archer, draws inspiration and energy from the spirited movement for racial justice and against anti-black racism rapidly rising in the United States of America and indeed around the world. Her bio is in your program. So without further ado, it is my great honor to welcome to the podium, Deborah Archer. Hello, thank you. Thank you for that warm applause and thank you for that very, very kind introduction, Patrick. 
I also want to thank you for your patience. He really worked with my schedule. This has been a challenge getting me up here, and I am so glad that I was finally able to join you all. I want to thank the Greater Burlington Multicultural Center for inviting me to participate in this annual event, and to Mayor Weinberger for um, being here in the very generous welcome, and as I said to you earlier, the warm weather and no snow. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here with all of you to celebrate Dr. King. Martin Luther King Jr. Day is, of course, a day of gratitude and recommitment. First, gratitude for Dr. King, for his service and dedication to the cause of racial justice, economic justice, and democracy. But it's also a day to thank and acknowledge the thousands of others who marched with him, protested with him, who strategized with him, and agitated with him. We do not know the names of many of those heroes, but we should never forget their sacrifices along celebrating his. It's also a day for all of us to come together and recommit to the fight for racial justice. Dr. King often spoke of the beloved community. He said, quote, the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community, so that when the battle is over, a new relationship comes into being between the oppressed and the oppressor. The beloved community was Dr. King's vision for a truly integrated America, where every person in every community had access to social and economic opportunity, not separate and unequal, but a society where everyone could live lives of joy and dignity, where everyone was invested in the well-being and dignity of their fellow human beings. Dr. King believed that the beloved community, we would experience equity and equality. We would experience true justice. Opportunity would not be parceled out to privileged individuals or groups, but instead we would be in a situation where that would be the birthright of each and every one of us. And in many, many ways, American history is the history of American opposition to that ideal. And more than 60 years later, America remains profoundly segregated along racial lines. We live separately, we learn separately, we socialize separately, we worship separately. The systems this country has so effectively built to protect the privileges and prerogatives of those with power to maintain segregated communities and prevent the birth of the beloved community have a tremendous negative impact on those who are excluded. And this is not because black people would get some magical benefit from living near white people or going to school with white people, from sitting in classrooms with white people. It's because you cannot separate the places that people have access to from the opportunities that people have access to. Our home, not only the physical residence, but the community in which it's located, impacts all of our lives in numerous and inter inter interdependent ways. There really is nothing that place does not touch. Our access to education and jobs, our physical safety, our health, our access to healthy food, our social networks, the quality of the air we breathe are all deeply impacted by where we live. And in so many ways, the history of black people in America is a history not just of control, but of exclusion. And the legal and social limitations on how and where black people live are central to that history. I became a civil rights lawyer for deeply personal reasons. I wanted to fight for the rights of people like me and family like, families like mine to live without discrimination and to be able to live with dignity and respect. I grew up not far from here in Connecticut in the 70s and the 80s, the child of Jamaican immigrants who worked really hard every day yet struggled to provide for our family because they were broke. They didn't have the opportunity to go to college. And they faced discrimination because they were black and because they were immigrants. And it's discrimination that although they tried, they couldn't shield their children from. And when I was a child, we moved from Hartford, Connecticut, which is a predominantly black and Latinx uh, city, to a working class Hartford suburb. My parents wanted to give me and my brother a chance to live in a safer community, to attend better schools, to be able to play in the park without them having to worry. And when we moved to Windsor, Connecticut, we were one of only three black families in our community. And our neighbors were not happy 
and they took every opportunity to remind us that we were not wanted, that we have stepped outside of the boundaries that America had created for us. And I remember the day that we woke up to find that our house and car had been vandalized and KKK had been spray painted in our house and our car. And I was so young, I was just nine or 10 years old. And my parents had to explain to my brother and me what the KKK was and why our neighbors did not want us there. And after that, I was terrified to be in that house that my parents had worked so hard to provide for us. I was terrified to play in our yard, to walk in those streets, and to go to school. And so I figured out very early on that I wanted to fight against the discrimination that my parents had to navigate every day, that sought to drive my family from our home. But I also wanted to understand the racism that required that my parents move from a predominantly black and Latinx community to a predominantly white neighborhood for us to t attend a quality education, and the racism that meant living in a white community was seen as safer and better, although we felt like constant targets for the time that we were there. And I've learned that America is fundamentally an idea, a set of principles and demands. The story of America is, at its heart, a story about the fight to protect and implement those principles and demands. Who gets to feel like they belong? Who gets to benefit from the unprecedented wealth of this nation? Who has access to the opportunities, the potential that being in America offers? Who gets to receive the equal protection of our laws? And who gets to live with safety and dignity? The work of the ACLU, in fact, the work that's in front of all of us, is fundamentally about closing the gap between the America that is promised and the America that is. And what is so remarkable and really so heartbreaking about America is its opposition to closing that gap. Our systems of separation and oppression have been so persistent because they are so malleable. Op oppression is creative, oppression adapts, it constantly evolves. Think about the way that racism has persisted and adapted throughout generations. America ratified the 15th Amendment and guarantees black men the right to vote. And America responds with poll taxes and grandfather clauses and voter ID laws. America makes Jim Crow and housing discrimination illegal. And then America responds with redlining and racially exclusionary housing policies, the criminalization of poverty and living while black. America makes slavery illegal. And America responds with mass incarceration, police brutality, and racial terror. In his famous poem, Let America Be America Again, Langston Hughes wrote, Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me. This is our constant struggle, bridging the gap between the America that was promised, the America in Langston Hughes's poem, and those who oppose that vision. We have the power to make America be America. We have the power to make America be America. Where the beloved community seeks to include, oppression and racism seek to exclude. Where everyone in the beloved community is treated with dignity, racism, racism defines its victims as unworthy, as less than. To get to the beloved community, to make America be America, we need to fight against racism, which to quote Dr. King, inflicts spiritual and physical homicide on its victims. Now, of course, this is a long and hard struggle, this fight to define who belongs and to create the beloved community. In 1857, Frederick Douglass, who you all know as an escaped enslaved person who became a prominent activist, an abolitionist, an author, public speaker, he warned that freedom wouldn't come easy. It takes constant struggle, constant fight. He said, quote, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. 
One of the most powerful strategies that the opponents of racial justice use is to tell us that we have no reason to fight, that we have no basis for outrage, that we have to keep our protests in check and wait. But we know that isn't true. Today, the fight for freedom takes thunder and lightning. The fight for freedom requires the ocean's awful roar. For more than a century after that speech by Frederick Douglass, in his famous letter from Birmingham jail, Dr. King responded to members of the clergy who called his work unwise and untimely. Dr. King wrote, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntary given, voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And over the past several years, we have all heard the demands of the oppressed. And we are beginning to shine a piercing light on all of the practices that are not only a part of America's racist past, but that remain central to America's current, present dehumanization of black bodies, black communities, and black identity. And by calling out the breath of America's sins against black people, we are finally locating the source of black America's problems, not in black people, but in the racism that's woven into the fabric of America. And we are pulling on the thread that connects so much of America's systems, laws, and structures, the need to control, regulate, and devalue black people. The need to tell us that we may have helped build this country, that we may have given our bodies in America's wars, that our culture animates much of what it means to be American, but that none of that matters because we do not and will never truly belong. So today the question we must ask ourselves is whether the conversations we're having about race will finally transform our systems, our practices, and our culture. I fear that change is going to be limited. We are still too often looking in the wrong places and asking the wrong questions, which lead us to the wrong answers. We are focused on the specific act of injustice before us, thinking about how we can correct that individual wrong and feeling like we've accomplished everything that needs to be accomplished when one person is held accountable for that act that we saw. But the actions of an individual bad guy, even when their evil is caught on camera for the world to see, that is not the full story of racism. For most black people living in America, racism is not Bull Connor sicking his dogs on black children seeking to integrate public schools while hurling racial slurs. Or a lone police officer with his knee on the neck of a black person pleading for his own life. This understanding of racism as the actions of individual racist people overlooks the centuries-long impact of race-based laws, policies, and practices that have caused and that continue to perpetuate racial inequality. It misses the racism of sending your children to under-resourced, heavily segregated public schools which consistently under-prepares its students for college and life, and then puts them on track for involvement with the criminal legal system. Those definitions miss the racism of living an hour and a half away from decent jobs because your community is ill-served by public transportation. It ignores the racism of a lack of access to supermarkets providing affordable and healthy food while your children are sick because they are exposed to the environmental stressors that fill your community, but you can't access regular health care. It ignores the long-time damage to black neighborhoods which were ripped apart through highway development and systemic underdevelopment at a cost that we can't even imagine to black wealth, health, and community. It will be difficult, if not impossible, to identify one person that's responsible for those uh, impacts. And certainly we can't find explicit evidence that racism motivated those decisions. But these are all faces of racism, none the same. So what can we do here in 2023? First, we need to reconcile with the past. The roots of racism in 2023 often have a direct line to racist policies and practices of the past. And we can't dismantle, can't dismantle racism today unless we take the time to acknowledge and explore those connections. You cannot have healthy fruit if you don't root out the poison in the tree. So this work, includes work to address slavery and its legacy. People often bristle. They don't want to talk about slavery anymore. It's impossible to move forward until we have acknowledged and addressed the impact of slavery. Slavery was a system of theft. 
It was theft of life as people were stolen, enslaved, and brutalized. Slavery was theft of property through forced labor. It was the theft of identity and home as people were repeatedly ripped from the community and culture that are central to human experience. It was theft of happiness, dignity, and potential. Slavery became imprinted onto the DNA of the nation and it remains the foundation of racial inequality. After the abolition of slavery, new systems of white supremacy evolved in its place to continue the theft and exploitation that were at slavery's core. Today we see the vestiges of slavery and mass incarceration and mass criminalization. We see it in police violence and brutality. The systems that replace slavery are all operating in the same vein as systems of theft, theft of life, theft of property, theft of identity and home, theft of happiness, dignity, and potential. They've adapted as they always have, but their work is the same. The death of Keenan Anderson, a black man who was tased to death by the LAPD and died just a few days ago, is the third person of color killed by the LAPD in 2023. We are just a few weeks in. It's the third person of color killed by the, 20, by the LAPD in 2023. It's on my heart today, and so I'm gonna use that as an example. The example of policing and public safety. Black people and black communities deserve effective and just public safety. But as we all know, the black community's relationship with policing has always been fraught, and that isn't a flaw in the system. It is endemic to its origin and design. From their inception, police have been tasked with protecting power and privilege, often by exerting control over black people and enforcing racial order. Modern policing has its roots in the suppression of slave revolts and in the creation of patrols to capture enslaved people who had escaped. Police were not the only tool of control of formerly enslaved people. Every element of the criminal legal system was brought to bear. Even as chattel slavery ended, black people were forced back into forced labor through convict leasing systems. Communities created categories of crime as a pretext to arrest black people or just arrested them without any pretext at all and courts sentenced them back into forced labor. And during J Jim Crow police forces throughout the South brutally enforced segregation, they joined lynch mobs during the civil rights movement, police officers beat protesters who marched for equality. And police were enlisted to ward off residential integ integration and protect the people who were terrorizing black families like mine who dared to move to historically white neighborhoods. And today we're still too often using the police as a tool to subjugate, control, regulate, surveil, and devalue black people and other people of color. And I'm sure that many of you have heard people say that this moment calls for a radical rethinking and transformation of our public safety system. And you probably wonder, what does that even mean and where do we begin? For me, a true transformation would mean that police are not the only resort for addressing harm. It means removing police from enforcement of low level offenses that shouldn't be criminalized in the first place. Today in communities of color, we have defunded education defunded affordable housing, defunded public transit and environmental safety. We have divested from the things that would make our communities truly healthy, happy, and safe. True transformation would mean investing in the resources and institutions that will allow communities to thrive. Affluent white communities already live in a world where they choose to fund youth, health, housing, and education as their primary investment in community safety and happiness. I'm sure that many of you live in communities like these. I know that I do. Today I drove around Burlington and did not see one police officer, but it seemed like a very safe and happy and healthy community. Communities like this have lower crime rates, not because they have more police, but because they have more resources to support the health and well-being of their community in a way that reduces crime. They don't criminalize their children. They design their own lives so that they walk through the world without having much contact or interaction with police at all. We need to identify and unravel the bias that leads us to believe that the same is not possible in communities of color. 
We are using police to manage the problems that our unequal systems has produced. And instead, we have to invest in meeting those challenges and those needs head on in every single community. In order to transform an institution, we need to wrestle with the racism that's underneath it. And of course, policing and public safety are not the only example. It's just the one, as I said, that was been on my heart today and it's been in the headlines for many, many years. Second, I think we need to eliminate the barriers to full participation in our political process. Following emancipation in a case called Dred Scott versus Sanford, the United States Supreme Court proclaimed that black people possessed no rights or privileges beyond what white men might choose to grant them. I think this belief is alive and well in too many areas of our life. I believe that it motivates the wave of voter suppression laws we're seeing sweeping across the country. Remember that Dr. King said voting is the foundation stone for political action. With it, the Negro can eventually vote out of office public officials who bar the doorway to decent housing, public safety, jobs, and decent integrated education. The right to vote is powerful. And I think what we are seeing today is heartbreaking and disgraceful, but totally predictable. The reaction to increasing political participation by people of color has always been a wave of voter suppression efforts. The 2008 election was the first presidential election in American history in which voters of color were one fourth of the nation's eligible electorate. And that election also saw a massive shift in the composition of early in-person voting with black voters casting their votes early in person more frequently than white voters. And the result was unprecedented efforts to cut back early in-person voting in states all around the country. And we also saw voter ID laws and voter purges. And that is what we're seeing today. Again, that it was predictable. Does it make it any less heartbreaking or devastating? Since the founding of our democracy, black voters and other voters of color have had to overcome relentless efforts to block us from casting our ballots. While the 15th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote on account of race, except for women, of course, because women were not included, in reality, black people who wanted to exercise their right to vote were intimidated, beaten, and sometimes killed. Those brutal efforts were followed by literacy tests and then poll taxes and grandfather clauses. So the fight to keep people of color from voting started with outright denial and brutality, and then it evolved into creative and ingenious methods to deny, dilute, and suppress the right to vote. We did have a period of relatively robust participation, but then there was retrenchment, as there always is. And although there are no more literacy tests and grandfather clauses, Today, we see a new generation of retrenchment and tools being employed across the country. Discriminatory redistricting and annexation plans, voter identification laws and verification laws, voter purges, at-large election schemes, a lack of voting machines and communities of color that means that black people had to wait in line for six, seven, eight, nine hours to cast their ballot. And traditionally, we have framed it as a fight for access to our democracy. Now the fight really is to protect our democracy, both protecting access for all eligible voters and what has become clear over the last several years to shore up democracy for everyone. Democracy is a threat to white supremacy, and so white supremacy is a threat to our democracy. In so many areas of civil rights and civil liberties, we are fighting a battle of ideas. But that does not mean anything if those who currently have and exercise disproportionate political power are able to use that power across the country to systematically disenfranchise people of color. Not only does it erect barriers to political participation, it will have the effect of further discouraging people from participating in the political process. And that is how democracies die. When people believe that they don't have any political power, and worse, when they may in fact be right. And then finally, I wanna mention that we need to challenge justice by geography. We are only as strong as our individual parts. As a country, we're only as strong as our individual states. There is work we all have to do to build a future where we, the people, means everyone everywhere can access their fundamental rights regardless of where they live. 
where everyone everywhere can live a choice-filled life with dignity and respect. Justice by geography has been a part of America's story from the very, very beginning. Place and space have long decided whether one is free or faces injustice, whether one has access to opportunity. And this truth is as clear today as it has ever been. Our country's union is barely being held together and the nation's past and present are being mapped along regional lines. We live in two Americas and geography increasingly determines whether one receives the full rights of citizenship and belonging. Today, the right to vote, the right to make healthcare decisions and the right to marry who you love depends on whether you live in California or Arkansas, Florida or Illinois. As I said, black voters stood in the baking sun for hours to vote in a Senate race simply because they're Georgians. Classrooms have been censored and students have been silenced and fed an alternate version of American history, one that erases the legacy and reality of racial inequality and systemic racial oppression because they live in Florida. We have to map a future where children have access to a high quality education regardless of where they live. We have to map a future where everyone has equal access to the ballot because our country needs more voices heard, not fewer. As we move forward from today, we need you to join the fight to unravel the racism that has woven itself into our systems and which grows deeper and more complex every day. People from all corners and segments of our society have been speaking out against the racial divides that plague our communities and economies. And that's obviously an important step and it is absolutely welcome. I drove past some folks holding up Black Lives Matter sign and it was wonderful and heartening to see that people are still working to get that message out. But we do need more. At the end of the day, these statements are not equally calibrated to the power that we all hold to transform our systems to affect change. Statements of support and increased diversity is an important first step but they can only do so much unless we also see systemic change. We need to say that racism, racism is wrong, but will you put the full weight of your power and privilege behind those words? You don't have to have created an equitable system to be a beneficiary of that system. And as a participant and a beneficiary in an equitable systems, we all need to decide whether we are going to embrace unearned privilege or work every single day to dismantle it. And I think that's a moral decision that each of us has to navigate. Over centuries, America has created a system where wealth, opportunity, education, health, safety are all inequitably distributed on the basis of race. Those systems don't require bad actors to perpetuate them. What they do require are everyday people, good people, to turn their backs to the injustices that benefit them. Uh, Martin Luther King wrote, quote, we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are responsible for dismantling systems of oppression because we are all bound together in that network. We are all responsible for each other. We are all called to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We are responsible for dismantling systems of oppression because the only thing that is necessary for the triumph of evil over good is for people like you to do nothing. You have extraordinary power and influence in every room that you are in, every single day, be an ally for racial justice. Civil rights leader Mary McLeod Bethune said that if we have the courage and tenacity of our forebearers who stood firmly like a rock against the lash of slavery, we shall find a way to do for our day what they did for theirs. This is our challenge. It is what I wake up thinking about every morning. It is what has helped me get through some of the most challenging days of the last several years. This is the call to action for all of us. And of course, we know that the road forward isn't simple. And true freedom, true inclusion, true equality will not be given easily. It will take every bit of ingenuity, every member of our community to ensure that we continue to move forward towards the beloved community. Progress will be halting 
as it always is, for every two steps forward, we can expect to take one step back. Progress will always be met with retrenchment. Toward the end of his poem, Langston Hughes makes a promise, and it is a promise that we are all called upon to embrace today, but every day. America, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. Today on this day of gratitude and reflection, we are all called upon to renew our pledge to work to make America, America, to move us closer to the beloved community and to continue the work and vision of Dr. King. Thank you. Bonjour. I know you speak a little French, right? So we are all joining from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Congolese Courier. So as you, as, as you guys you know, uh, Congo is in Central uh, Africa. And uh, we speak uh, five languages and almost 400 dialects. But uh, this evening, we're going we're gonna to sing three, uh, three songs in French, uh, Lingala and Swahili. Okay, thank you. The first song is in French, so uh, Merci uh, Jésus, it means uh, thank you Jesus, we praise you, we adore you, we sing to you and we acclaim you. Merci Jésus, merci Jé, merci Jésus, Jé, merci Jésus, merci Jé, Alléluia, Alléluia, nous te louons, 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 Alléluia, Alléluia, nous t'adorons, nous t'adorons. Nous t'adorons, Alléluia, Alléluia. Nous te chantons, nous te chantons, nous te chantons, Alléluia, Alléluia. Nous t'acclamons, nous t'acclamons, nous t'acclamons, Alléluia, Alléluia. Nous t'acclamons, nous t'acclamons, nous t'acclamons, Alléluia, Alléluia, Maranatha, 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 Alléluia, 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 Alléluia. Alléluia, Alléluia. Merci Jésus, merci Jésus, merci Jésus. 
Merci Jésus. Alléluia, Alléluia. Thank you, merci. This, the second song will be in Lingala. Loboko nangai eko simba yezu makasi na kokoyate means my hand shakes hand with Jesus and I will not fall. Lobo konanga eh eko simba yesu makasi na pokwe ate Thank you so much. And at the end, we're going to sing in Swahili. I know a lot of American people, they went in Kenya, Tanzania, why not in Congo, Rwanda, they speak Swahili, right? It, okay. Tunashukuru baba wa mungu baba wa mbinguni. So it means we will sing all days of our lives because of your kindness to us, the peace you gave us, and the life you gave us. And uh, I'm gonna finish with one quote of Martin Luther King, uh, who said, we may all have come from different ships, but we are in the same boat now. Thank you. Bamba wa mbingu 
mbinguni Bamba wa mbinguni Bamba wa mbinguni Bamba wa mbinguni Oni Kushukuru Pani Uruma yako Nema yako Nio ya milele Milele Na milele Siku zote Tunakushukuru Thank, thank you so much. As a member of uh, Trusted Community Voices of the City of Burlington, and also I'm a human rights activist, so all Congolese people, they told me to say one thing. You guys, you, you, you have a please to think about uh, a global justice, because many things happen in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there's like 20 years ago, but people they are very silent. I will ask you guys to go to read the, the, the story, what happened in the east part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you so much. Our Congolese friends, I'm from Kenya and so I <laughs> I understand that kind of music and I'm so in I was I'm supposed to sing I wish I knew how it would feel to be free but if you will indulge me I'm going to ask my Congolese friends to sing with me this song <laughs> Ya okoa injili ya Yesu Ya okoa 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 Ya okoa injili ya Yesu Ya okoa
mana niyo mana tunasema Niyo mana Niyo mana niyo mana tunasema Niyo mana tunasema yende mbele Ya upendo injilio Ya upendo Ya upendo injilio yesu Injilio Ya upendo Injilio Yesu Ya upendo Niyo mana Tunasema Ya upendo Niyo mana Thank you. Yeah. You know Martin Luther King, um, Dr. Martin Luther King, understood the power of music as a weapon that can create change. And so today you've listened to various pieces from our African friends here. And we know that the music in, the, in America is a music of power and stories. <sighs> so today, there's just so much to say, you know, and I know you know these stories well. And um, Dr. Martin Luther King used music alongside he collaborated with other musicians like Nina Simone, Aretha Franklin, uh, Mah Mahalia Jackson and so many others alongside him to inspire others to remind themselves that they were not alone that they had to remain hopeful that there was a light at the end of the tunnel so this song I will sing just to remind ourselves of times past. This song that became an anthem every time he marched, whenever he had events and people would gather together and Nina Simone sang this song and I listened to it one time and I was like smitten and I loved the song. I'm not going to sing like Simone, but I will try. <laughs> this is my rendition. Mm-hmm. Sing like me. I wish I knew how it'll feel to be free. I wish I could break all the chains holding me. Wish I could say all the things that I should say. I can't breathe. Open the door for me. I need a piece of the pie. My black life matters. Say him loud. Say him clear. For the whole wide world to hear I wish I could share For the love that's in my heart Remove all the bars That keep us apart I wish you could know what it means to be me then you'd see and agree that every man ought to be free I wish I could give all of longing 
willing to give I wish I could live like I'm longing to live I wish I could do all the things that I should do and although I'm way overdue I'll be starting anew Sing with me I wish I could be Like a bird in the sky How sweet it would be If I found I could fly out So in the sky and look down at the sea then i'd say i would say i know i am free and i sing yes i would sing would you say that and i sing yes i would sing i really can hear you now i would sing yes i would sing come on now i would say Yes, I would say. I would sing. Yes, I would sing. Come on, now I can hear you. I would sing. I know how it feels. Yes, I would sing. Come on. I need to hear you back. Yes, I would sing. I'd say I'm free. Yes, I would sing. Free. Free. Yes, I was free at last, free at last. Yes, I would sing. Yes, free. Yes, I would sing. I already know. Oh, yes, I already know how it means to be free thank you thank you <laughs> thank you now as we go head out we will sing together this beautiful anthem that symbolized all the themes that Dr. Martin Luther King was fighting for social justice, discrimination, ending, ending discrimination, and you know all the things that he was fighting for. So as you walk outside, I hope that you feel inspired as you go out there. Do your part. Make this dream a reality in your life. see us through. Lord will see us through. Yes, he shall. We'll see us through. Lord will see us through. Someday. Oh, deep in my
will walk hand in hand. I'll be able to say I love you, my brother, my sister, someday. Do you believe, do you really believe that we shall overcome someday? We'll live in peace. Yes, we will. We shall live in peace. Glory, hallelujah. shall make us free. I know it really does. Shall make us be. And the truth shall make us free. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the true spirit of Dr. King, thanks to all our wonderful musicians. And so as we take our leave of this wonderful space and we carry the dream of Dr. King in our hearts, in our thoughts, going forward to build a more equitable society, a more livable world, I would like to thank you all. So I just want to invite you to come up front and greet our esteemed keynote speaker just to help welcome her to Burlington, to cold Burlington, Vermont. And I'm going to ask Kim Carson also to join her. And this is a good opportunity to welcome her to Burlington, except she's here in a, on a more permanent basis other than her keynote. So don't start a conversation, just a brief greeting. Thank <laughs> you.